Hi, in this video I thought we'd have a little look at PCB layout and design rules. But before we start that I thought I'd just show you where I am with the lighting control project. So if you recall what I was going to do is design a main board that had four spacers where you could plug in four different little PCBs depending on what you wanted that particular control board to do. So I've been designing those particular boards. The one on screen here is the trailing edge dimmer and these little boards are only 75 by 15 millimeters so really quite small and the idea is that they're going to plug in through this 10 pin header on the left hand side and then there'll also be a little screw on the right hand side and so yeah this is the lighting dimmer uh, for AC powered stuff so we've sort of got our isolation slot along here in blue and then all of the stuff on this side is at mains potential so no ground plane or anything on here it's not needed uh, we've got our MOSFET sitting up here some suppression uh, terminal blocks and then uh, the zero crossing stuff at the bottom and then we've sort of got some electronics here just to interface with the main board then we've got a relay module which is just if you want to be able to turn something on and off without the complexity of dimming and then there's a couple of resistors on each board which tell the main board what module is plugged in so we've got a couple of resistors here I think it's R9 and R7 depending on the value of those it will know what module it is similarly there's just a, a simple PWM PD, PCB so this has just got three MOSFETs for driving uh, LED strips all that kind of thing uh, nothing complex on here really and then I've just started to lay out the main board so here you can see the four modules uh, or the outlines for the modules that are going to plug into the main board and then we've got the, obviously the board outline here so I've still got to place all the components but the schematics pretty much done uh, so we've got three pages of schematics the microcontroller um, some general electronics power supplies um, some LED indicators that kind of thing uh, and then we've got the interfaces which go off to the four plug-in modules so these are just multiplexers so that I can read all of the inputs and outputs and then these are the 12 interfaces to the potential switches that could be connected to the main board and I've gone a little bit overboard on here this is just to provide some circuit protection our switch input is going to come in from um, this pin here we've got some zener diodes and a fuse for protection in case for some reason it did end up with mains plugged in uh, to the wiring uh, basically this will just blow the fuse after that um, and then we've got sort of a constant current driver which drives our LED in the opto isolator and then this is fed off to our logic circuit so uh, we've got uh, 12 of those although they don't all have to be populated necessarily but that's pretty much all that's on there so my next task is to start laying out that board and that's sort of what prompted this video because I was thinking about laying it out on a four layer PCB then I was thinking about the design rules so I thought we'd just go through the general PCB design process. Right, so I thought I'd use one of my old PCB layouts as a reference point. This is not a perfect layout by any means. It was done quite a long time ago, but it does illustrate a few concepts. Uh, this is one of my uh, audio projects. So a USB DAC at the bottom and a headphone amplifier at the top. And this worked really well, actually. Um, it's a really nice project. Um, but the first thing that you want to do is work out your board outline. So there's nothing worse than designing your board, having it made, and then not being able to find a case for it to fit in perfectly. So find your case and then work out the size of board that you want to fit in there. The next thing you want to do is work out what kind of technology you're going to have on the board uh, because you need to find your PCB supplier that is going to be able to make these boards and there's no point in coming up with a design that's never going to be manufacturable. So in this case I wanted a two layer PCB, I knew I was going to need two layers at least because uh, there's quite a lot of routing to go on on the board. So um, then what you want to do is just check the capabilities. So um, in the example here we're going to look at JLC PCB's capabilities and then also their design rules. So they're obviously able to make one to six layer PCBs so I know that I can get my two layer board there. Um, I haven't got any controlled impedance lines but if you're designing something with RF design in there or you wanted some 50 ohm tracers uh, this is important because you need to understand all of these rules here. Uh, FR4 material and then you've got your maximum dimension so a lot of PCB suppliers will have a limit on the maximum board size that they can produce but also on the minimum board size so uh, make sure that your board is able to be manufactured in this region you can see here basically you can make your boards up to about 40 by 40 um, centimeters so pretty big boards if you need them and then we've got some tolerancing for the routing depending on the type of project you're doing the color might be important we can get the six colors at JLC PCB and obviously we've got our selection of thicknesses of PCBs 
things that might be important is if you know you're designing a high energy PCB, so something with a, a big DC to DC or lots of AC powered stuff on there, uh, you might want to consider looking at using thicker tracers. So the two ounce copper is twice as thick and it means that you can carry more current for a given trace width, which might be important on slightly more densely populated PCBs. And then you've got your general design rules. So all of these are essentially saying what JLC PCB are able to produce, and that is on highly densely populated PCBs, you might want traces very close together. So you want to look at these things like the trace width and the trace spacing. Um, because you might be placing your tracers too closely together and that means that uh, when they go to the etching part you wouldn't actually get two separate tracers. So all of these settings are um, available in most design packages so what you'd do is you'd have a look at all of these on the JLC PCB website and then if you go to your design rule package and it's in um, different places in different packages but um, basically you can set what your rules are going to be and what happens is if these are all incorrect so I'll set these to something quite high then you can start to see the PCB package is saying that there's some errors around here because these pads are too close together so it's highlighted all of these pads that are too close together basically saying you've got a problem here with the rules that you've set your PCB manufacturer wouldn't be able to make these boards so what you do is you set all of those design rules correctly and then if you're starting to lay some tracers too closely together it will warn you and you can know to move those apart so that you can have a manufacturable PCB. And the rules for trace to trace width are often quite different from pad to tracers so you can see it's highlighted the pad uh, to trace here. Those are not usually the same. But I'm not going to go too much into the design rules just to say it's worth a good look at what those design rules are and particularly if you do order from JLC PCB when you send your design in it will get analysed and if there are any problems you will get an email or you'll get notified that your PCB is either not manufacturable or if there's some queries they'll come back with the queries to uh, work out the best way forward. Right so once you've set up your environment and your design rules the next thing you want to do is start laying out your board. So where do you begin? Well the first thing you want to do is start placing all of the fixed components. So things like connectors, uh, indicator LEDs, that kind of thing that are either going to be interfacing with the outside world or need mechanical integration, those want to go on first. So on this board I started laying out the USB connector first and the phono connectors and then on the headphone amplifier I knew that the headphone jack and the volume control needed to be on the front panel so those sat together at the front. And then you want to start placing things quite logically so uh, depending on how your design is working you may want to place it out by functional blocks. So on this design we've sort of got the power supply circuitry at the top here and this is also mounted on the headphone amplifier board because this is uh, going to be using the majority of the power. Um, and then you want to try and group components together as well where possible. So we've sort of got our power in, two capacitors sitting together uh, and then we've got two layouts here for our two voltage rails with very similar layouts so that it's quite easy to construct that PCB. Then you want to start placing components as logically as possible. So uh, in the case of the USB DAC part of the design, I actually designed it so that it mimicked the schematic in some way. So you've got your signal flow from left to right. You've got your USB port going into the USB DAC chip and then the analog electronics from that point onwards feeding out from the left to right. So we've got all of our components and they're laid out as a mirror image to uh, make it easy to lay out and to construct but also so it looks quite neat and then these go off to the phono connectors. Where there's important components like the crystal you want those as physically close to the IC as possible so you want to always try and place the critical components around your um, main components so decoupling capacitors, crystals, that kind of thing you want to place those and then the non-critical parts so things like these LEDs that I've got here and some components for uh, general bulk capacitance, that kind of thing. They can sit a little bit further away from the components in the free space. Then when you come to routing, what you want to do is you want to have a think about the best way to route these signals and which ones are important. So in particular here I paid attention to the analog circuitry so we had a nice simple layout that was mirror imaged, had a good ground plane all around it for the best signal integrity. And the other thing to say about signal integrity is that where you've got lines that are running parallel to each other, 
you are going to encounter some crosstalk between those lines. So what you want to do is any critical signals you either want to surround with a ground plane so that there's less likelihood of any signals being capacitively coupled into those lines and where lines do need to cross try and cross them at right angles because that presents the best protection against crosstalk. Then you'll want to start thinking about the trace width and this really depends on the amount of current that's flowing. Um, so obviously if you've got a longer trace width immediately you've got more resistance so depending on the amount of current that you want to carry you'll want to increase the trace width if your trace is going a further distance and the typical rule of thumb for the maximum current that any particular trace width can handle is for one amp the minimum trace width has to be 10 mil or 10 thou um, 2 amp 20 thou and 3 amp 30 thou and so on on a 1 ounce copper board so if you did use a 2 ounce copper board you could halve those widths to save space. Along with resistance we've obviously got the inductance of the traces so if you've got anything uh, on the end of a long length of trace you've got that inductance to cope with. That has two problems that may mean that you get uh, some ringing on your digital signals but it may also mean that it becomes an excellent antenna for picking up RF which may be unwanted in your design so if you've got uh, very high impedance traces you may want to think about either burying them on an inner layer on a four layer board or uh, surrounding them with ground plane and keeping them as short as possible. Next up in the layout you want to have a little think about the thermal performance and the thermal layout. So in this headphone amplifier these uh, little op amp buffers which are on the underside of the board do get a little bit warm and you can see I've got these thermal vias which are conducting some heat onto the top layer of the PCB. These ones weren't too bad but in areas where you've got a lot more heat so for example these uh, regulators where possible you want to try and site things like capacitors and other thermally sensitive devices a little bit further away where possible and you may just want to site them slightly further away just so that you can get airflow around those components so it's no use having a really hot component surrounded by other components it will mean you get no airflow and then that component will get significantly hotter and then once you've placed all of your main components and routed some of the important traces after that it's just a case of joining the dots basically so if you've got an integrated piece of software where your schematic integrates with the layout you'll end up with a rat's nest so you'll see these lines telling you where you need to connect traces and then basically you can go around joining the dots in the best way possible um, so that you get your layout looking how you want it to and it may mean that you need to rip up and move components around a little bit to get the optimal layout but really at that point it's just a case of joining the dots um, and then shuffling things around to get the layout that you actually want. So that's just a little look at PCB layout and some design rules. I'm going to continue with my lighting project, try and get that main board done, uh, and then we'll get the boards made at JLC PCB, and then we'll be able to start assembling the lighting project. I've got a few other designs which have come in, so we've got a couple more projects that we're going to do, and then I think we're going to go to the audio projects, which I spoke about a while ago, I think I'm definitely going to design the new high-end DAC and a new headphone amplifier. If you've got any other ideas for any other projects, I know someone mentioned the Universal Soldering Station. I may well look into designing one of those. But if you've got any ideas for other projects that you want me to do on this channel, uh, leave a comment down below with any thoughts. And I'll certainly uh, have a think about uh, whether I can do those. So I hope you found the video useful. And until next time, thanks for watching.